Hi, so I'm Jaron, and I'm here tonight for Noble Desktop. For those of you who don't know us, Noble Desktop is a software training company. It's been around for, I think, about 30 years or more at this point. Basically, we're centered in New York City. We actually have an office on 34th Street in Madison, right in the middle of New York City. It's a really pretty cool area. We do on-site as well as online classes, and we cover a wide range of subjects from graphics, animation, to coding, to stuff like Microsoft Office and that sort of thing. So we do a whole bunch of different things. Okay, so this is our intro to Adobe After Effects class. And this is basically a lecture-based class. This particular one, our in-person our in-person and online classes, our actual software training classes, are a combination of lecture and hands-on. We have like exercises you do and that sort of thing, but in an hour and a half session, it's, it's not possible. So this is basically gonna be me talking, demoing, answering your questions, that sort of thing. If you type a question in the chat window, because I have multiple windows, I will try to get to it. Oh, cool. <laughs> I, will, I will try to get to it. If not, there'll be a QA and a session at the end. So if any questions I don't get to, you can ask at the end. And since, to be honest, I actually have some free time at the end of this session, if there's any special requests, I'll, I'll, try, to, I'll try to address them because it's, it's kind of cool. If there is something directly related to what I'm talking about, I'll try to add that in to, to what I'm saying as I'm, as I'm going through it. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera just to save bandwidth on my side. So that's what I look like if anyone cares with my nice little bowling shirt. <laughs> I, I don't actually bowl. Okay, so I'm going to stop that, that video. Okay. So, first of all, After Effects. Okay, so, okay, so first of all, After Effects is an old program. I forget exactly how old, but I've used it for more than 20 years, and I think it was on version 4 or 5 when I started using it. So, it's an old program, okay? It was originally made by a company called Cosa, and then Adobe bought it, and so on and so forth. And they've been developing it for a very long time. Now, After Effects is basically a program for two main uses. Animation, video compositing, and in the compositing thing, we also do visual effects. Okay. Now, animation causes a problem when we talk about this. When most people think of animation, they think of cartoon style animation. And and yes, you can do that in After Effects. Um, certain cartoons, like Archer uses After Effects for some of its animation and some of its compositing work. And there are TV cartoons that do use it. But when most people think of After Effects, they're actually thinking about motion graphics or motion graphic design. So the phrase motion graphics is actually short for motion graph design. Some people call it MoGraph or whatever, motion design, whatever. When I went to school, it was called broadcast design, but effectively it's basically the specific style of animation that you normally see in, in video and on television and that sort of thing. So show opens, titles, that sort of thing are usually considered motion graphics. Now you also see traditional graphic design elements like um, infographics and, and informational animation also under the banner of motion graphics. So really, I would say that motion graphics is a specific style of animation. And we actually do a, we actually have another session on Thursday that is specifically introduction to motion graphics. Okay. So again, when I went to school, this was all called broadcast design because that's who used it, was broadcast television. But over the last, I got my master's, what, about like, actually at this point, wow. I think I got my master's like 20 years ago, wow. I'm old, so, so. but um, when I got my master's and it was in this area, mostly Affix was used for broadcast television animation. But over the last, like again, 10, 20 years, it's become more commonly used by a lot of people. So After Effects has grown from a st very, very specific tool that was basically used by this handful of animators who did broadcast animation into a tool that's used by not everyone, but a massively large chunk of people. 
So you've got people who are creating video and animation for social media using it. I've worked with people who do presentation graphics for corporate presentation graphics. They're using After Effects to create animations to include in PowerPoint slideshows. Okay. Um, people use it to creating graphics for television. Uh, there was this, um, what was that company? There was a, a lot of broadcast television level uh, compositing and visual effects are done in After Effects. MTV used to have a television show called The Green Screen Show. And it was actually all green screen removal and compositing done in After Effects itself. Hey. Yeah, so After Effects in general produces video. So if I'm going to export video, After Effects is an amazing program for that. But it doesn't really produce content for things other than that. There are add-ons for it that can produce stuff for displaying online. But effectively, if you're looking for a program to produce video content, After Effects is your tool. So usually what we export from here are actually video. According to Adobe, that's how Adobe describes After Effects. It's designed to create cinematic movie titles and intros. Remove objects from video if you want to get rid of things you don't like. Even add and net create things in 3D space. While After Effects itself does not have a 3D um, engine, it does partner well with certain 3D animation programs, most notably Cinema 4D from Maxon. Okay. Which is pretty cool. So it's basically an industry standard tool for motion graphics animation and, again, television level visual effects. Most films are using other technologies for create the visual, to create the visual effects and compositing. Um, the Star Wars films, the J.J. Abrams Star Wars films, the new Star Wars films. The, um, wow, what were they done? The, all the screen, the UI effects on all the computer screens, and the hologram effects they used in them were done in After Effects. In the J.J. Abrams Star Trek show, the Star Trek movies, the newer ones, all of, apparently, the screens and user interface stuff on their computers was actually done in, in After Effects. It was all animated in After Effects. But they actually used other things to do their special effects and their animation. So it has a place in Hollywood film, but again, most commonly you do see it in other places. Okay. So by the way, if someone asked, why does Cine was it partner with Cinema 4D? So years ago, After Effects partnered with, um, oh wow, what is it? Maya. And then Maya, the company that makes Maya, decided to make their own compositing program. So Adobe started looking for other partners and they basically partnered with Maxon. So the companies have a strategic relationship. So that's why the software works so well. It's purely a, a corporate decision. Um, but they actually integrate very well because the companies and the development teams are working together. So at the moment, the best 3D program to work with After Effects, as in I can import Cinema 4D files into After Effects, is Cinema 4D. I can still use graphics in 3D created in other programs, but they don't actually directly work together. That's all. So really, it's more of a, of a corporate thing. I can create graphics in any 3D program. The problem is, is that they don't directly import. I'd have to export video and then import it, and then it's not exactly a, a smooth relationship, let's say that. But people actually create 3D graphics and a whole bunch of things and then do work on it they basically use the export video and then work on that in After Effects. So keep that in mind. After Effects integrates well with certain programs, not so well with others. Uh, is everyone hearing me okay? The... should be... Okay. Okay, yeah, so it's probably your side. Sorry, person who's having a problem with the volume. <laughs> Just making sure. Cause I've, got a, I've got a mic right near my face, so it should be pretty loud. Um... So, like I said, uh, when I get into After Effects, I'll, I'll show it to you that the, you can actually technically use other programs that are, aren't necessarily the ones with the best workflow with After Effects, but some programs will definitely work better than others. Okay. So, what do you need to run it? At least 8 gigs of RAM. I was working with someone today who was using 8 gigs of RAM. It's not an enjoyable experience, trust me, okay? So, Adobe recommends 16 gigs or more. 
So the more RAM you've got, the better it works. In After Effects, all previews are done in RAM. So the more RAM you got, the longer previews you can get, the more things it can preview for you. So lots of RAM. <laughs> yeah, so for the record, you'll be seeing my computer. My computer is a 2015 MacBook Pro that I'm using to demo this. And, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's not a bad experience, but effectively, you'll see that there are certain things that are going to take longer to preview than others. If I had more RAM, it would definitely be better. But yeah, they recommend as much RAM as possible. They also recommended Adobe to having a dedicated video card. It'll give you a better experience than having like a video card integrated into your motherboard. So effectively, it'll run on a wide range of machines. It, it just works better on higher end ones, obviously. I mean, that that's pretty standard. Okay, so I'll do that. Woohoo! Okay, so who's it for? Anyone who needs to add animation, motion graphics, even character animation, export as video. That's the key. This program is designed to export video files. Okay, while there are plugins for it that can send out like web content, like HTML5 animation and that sort of thing, its native feature is exporting video. Okay, if you need to composite or combine graphics and video with graphics or other video, After Effects may be for you, okay? Also, people need to integrate with other Adobe apps. That should say Premiere Pro, by the way. Premiere Pro, After Effects, Photoshop, Illustrator, Audition. That's one of the things that if you're using an Adobe workflow for the creation of your graphics, you can basically import and bring those right into After Effects, no problem at all. After Effects audio features are weak to say the least. So we have Audition as part of our creative cloud software to allow us to edit audio. And Adobe's idea behind the creative cloud is that while not everything it has works together, large chunks of it do. So I can create my graphics in Photoshop and Illustrator. I can cut up and edit my video in Premiere Pro. I can combine all of that together in After Effects, either send it back to Premiere Pro or animate it in After Effects and export it. And I can do all of my audio editing and work in Audition. And that's the basic idea of their programs working together, okay? So if you're already using like Photoshop Builders to make graphics and want to add an animation tool, After Effects may be for you, okay? There's one program there I forgot to list actually, Adobe Animate. Adobe Animate is basically what used to be called Flash. Flat, Adobe Animate actually integrates into After Effects as well. I can use Animate's frame-by-frame -frame animation tools and then basically output that directly to After Effects to use After Effects compositing and additional animation tools. So, like I said, large chunks of their creative cloud are intended to work together to let you produce, again, video. Because <laughs> that's what it exports. Okay. So, if you're, again, using a creative cloud production workflow. You might use Photoshop for your photo manipulation and creation of pixel-based assets. Maybe you like to paint. You could paint in Photoshop, okay? Maybe using Illustrator for creation of your vector graphics, your logos, your spot illustrations, and that sort of thing, okay? Premiere Pro is your video editing program. And finally, Audition is for audio repair and sweetening. And in one way or another, they all integrate with After Effects. Okay, except maybe Audition. It doesn't really integrate. It just kind of you make your audio there and bring it in. Okay. So usually I get asked, what's the difference between After Effects and Premiere Pro? Because people use certain words, I'd say badly, like video editing. <laughs> um, people use the word video editing as a blanket phrase for anything that works with video even not necessarily straight editing. So After Effects is an animation program. Again, mostly geared towards motion and graphic design style stuff, but again, you can animate characters in it, okay? It's also used for video compositing, bringing together videos together. Maybe I shoot something in front of a green screen and I need to get rid of the green screen, put a new background in. Maybe I have something in the background I need to get rid of. Maybe I 
shot video of someone against a wall and maybe there's some dirt from some tape that was on the wall. Or perhaps there's a door frame there I want to get rid of. After Effects is a tool to do that. Actually pretty well. It's actually one of the examples I'm going to do tonight, by the way, right before we have time. Motion tracking allows me to track the movement of something in my video so I can make graphics move with it. Again, if you've ever seen pretty much any f television show on the planet, um, if you've seen Doctor Strange, the Marvel movie, those hand effects of those wizards doing, the, it's, it's clearly not real. It's something moving with the hand. It's a graphic animated to follow the hand. That's motion tracking. Okay? I have video effects that can alter video, change its color, change its style, make it look more interesting than it is. Or maybe just clean it up. Okay? And 3D camera tracking. 3D camera tracking allows me to track and analyze the camera that shot my video so I can then add graphics into it that look like they were there in the first place. Maybe I've got a graphic lined up to the side of a wall. Maybe I've got something sitting on a table. That's what camera tracking does. As a group they also call it match moving by the way. Well, Premiere Pro is pretty much a straight video editing program. You need to cut your audio and video files and assemble them together. You're editing a short film or a commercial or a movie. Okay. Multicam editing features. So I can combine video shots simultaneously together in a seamless way. Color correction and grading. Video Premiere Pro. Audio fixing and sweetening. Also Premiere Pro. And some of the video effects are the same. A lot of people ask, which is easier, After Effects or Premiere Pro? So the problem is they do different things. If I'm trying to edit video in After Effects, After Effects isn't built for that, so it's actually harder to do that there. If I'm trying to animate something in Premiere Pro, Premiere Pro isn't built to do that, so obviously it's hard to do there. If you wanted to know which is just easier as a general rule to use for its own specialty, I'd say Premiere Pro. So for the record, everybody, I, I don't sugarcoat this. Adobe pretty much admits that After Effects is the most difficult program they have. It's been around for a long time, and when I open it up, you'll see the interface is really kind of convoluted, but it does a lot of things. Okay, It's a powerful program, and honestly, it's why we have classes in it. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, I'd, I'd agree with Connie, by the way, on that one. I'd say Premiere Pro is easier than AE. AE, in general, I consider it the most difficult program Adobe makes, and... Like, because effectively, Premiere Pro does very specific things. But After Effects does a wider range of things. So I know people who specialize in animating in After Effects, but they don't necessarily know the compositing features or the motion tracking features. If you wanted to master the programs... Yeah. Yeah, so, so by the way, After Effects is more difficult than Photoshop, because Photoshop only basically does one image at a time. After Effects does what Photoshop does, but for... Video, video, even at its slowest frame rate, like 24, which is film, is 24 images per second. So imagine what Photoshop does, but adding in the ability to animate that and work with it over time. So, and a lot of, by the way, if you know Photoshop for the record, a lot of the Photoshop functions exist, but again, for video inside of After Effects. So... Yes, After Effects is hard, but it's also amazingly powerful. It's also, keep in mind, most people don't use everything about the program. Um, I'm an Adobe certified expert in After Effects. I, I've literally written books on this program. So my job is to, is to really understand it. Most users of the program use a subset of its features. So if you wanted to master everything in After Effects, I've been using it for 20 years. I'd say I still haven't done that. The more software you know, the more software you learn, the easier it is to learn new software. Personally, I'm a certified expert in Photoshop, Illustrator, After Effects, and Premiere Pro, by the way. And knowing each of those programs helps me learn new software. Probably every video on the planet, by the way. <laughs> every music, probably every music video on the planet uses After Effects. Um, most music videos, by the way, most things at, at music video level and up until about non-pay non, non television levels, so basically like basic cable and stuff, 
usually use After Effects for its compositing and effects. So you've basically seen it probably everywhere you've seen video. All right, here's some examples. <laughs> so these, again, these links are gonna be available on our website because you'll be able to get the presentation. And the Archer TV show uses After Effects, that's an article about it, uses After Effects for some of its animation and its compositing of its elements. If you've ever seen the video from Rocket Jump, they basically pretty much use entirely Adobe software. Okay. Okay. And there's a, a example video, Headspace's Guide to Animation, which is pretty cool, actually. Nice animation. Again, they used After Effects for the animation features, and it was work that was created using assets in, After, in Illustrator, Photoshop, and then animated in After Effects, plus a bunch of other things. So After Effects is probably one of the most common programs that you see video stuff. Pretty much anything below the Hollywood film level was probably done in After Effects. Okay. And that being said, there are some Hollywood films that use After Effects. The original Deadpool film used actually Premiere Pro for editing and After Effects for some of its effects. The, oh wow, the latest Terminator film, Dark... I forget the name of it. The latest Terminator film, actually used After Effects for some of its pre um, from its previs work. Okay, it's pretty cool. Okay, by the way, uh, if you were actually missed our presentation last week on Premiere Pro, it's actually on our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube and search for Noble Desktop, it was actually uploaded, um, I think actually yesterday, was my presentation on last week on Premiere Pro, if you're interested. But yeah, our YouTube channel is where we play, paste all of our live streams. And for the record, you can actually go see some of the other After Effects, Intro to After Effects ones we've done from other people because different instructors do them. And if you want to see some of the variety of what's possible on the program. So every time this is done, the instructors pick different examples. So if you're interested, YouTube.com and search for Noble Desktop. I will try to put a link in the chat window when I get a chance. Okay, but yeah, you've probably seen After Effects everywhere. I'm not, I'm not joking. It's like one of the most ubiquitous programs on the planet. Okay. Now, everyone asks how much it costs. Thank you. All right. So, if you're just buying After Effects, it's basically $21 a month. So, unfor not unfortunately, but the way Adobe works is they have a subscription service. So you basically pay a monthly fee, and you can actually get the software for, if you wanted to, several, like a year, you can like prepay a year or two at a time. But if you want just one program, it's basically $21. The problem is, is that usually, you're gonna need After Effects and other programs. So if you're only using After Effects, After Effects doesn't really make graphics. Photoshop and Illustrator do. So usually most people actually need After Effects plus a couple other things at least in the Creative Cloud. And that's where the Creative Cloud Complete comes in. That's the price, $53 a month for everything. You get After Effects, Premiere, Audition, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Dreamweaver, and everything else they make, plus all their sample and beta software. Yeah, yeah I use Creative Cloud Complete because it's, it's cool. If you are a student, or if you are related to a student who has a student ID, you may actually qualify for the student version of the software, which is the same thing. The educational version is the exact same thing as the full version. Yeah, exactly. Someone put that in the chat window. It's like twenty dollars as opposed to the fifty-two ninety-nine. And like I said, anybody, any student qualifies for that, or any educator actually, if you're uh, a teacher. It's pretty cool. Okay, that's the last one, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, because I'll come back and show that later. Later now let's talk about after effects this is after effects okay so we're gonna do a couple things here let me actually turn on the background okay so this one we're gonna try to do a little later let me actually turn back on the nothing so it's basically a uh, little text animation a little logo animation and I want to start with something else though because it shows more more functions in the program I'm going to go to File, Open Recent, what I had, and Picture Animation. So here's what I want to try and build. I want to try and build this animation that has some images. They're here. And when it plays, that's what happens. 
gameplay. So there's some images there. They're all still images. There's actually some video in the background of basically that cloud or blowing smoke or whatever you want to describe it as, and that's actually video. And then it moves over and it reveals some text. Okay, that's, that's the goal. So I want to build this. So After Effects allows me to combine, or allows us to combine, images, like those, video, like that, with text and graphics created either in After Effects itself or in other applications. Okay. And like I said, very often the, con the things you're animating in After Effects are actually made in other places. The two most common programs where you import files from are Photoshop and Illustrator. But as this is going to show you, I don't have to use Photoshop and Illustrator. I can actually create things here. These are all just, just photos. Okay, that's, that's all they are, photos. With the exception of that video file, everything here is a photo and that text is actually just a text layer in After Effects. Okay. Which is pretty cool. So this is what I want to build. Or something like it, maybe. It'll probably change as I come up with new ideas. Okay, so I'm going to close this project. So After Effects is a little interesting when it comes to a, other Adobe software. I can only have one project open at a time. Okay. So in most Adobe programs, you can open as many documents as you want. Here, I get one. <laughs> so if I have a product open, try to open a new project, it basically closes. When you first open After Effects, it's, you're actually opening and working in an untitled project right now, right there. Okay. So I'm going to save that untitled project. File, save as, save as. Okay. And the After Effects file format is AEP. I'm, I'm just going to name this um, photo animation. There's no rules on file names, by the way. You can actually name them whatever you want. So, have fun with that. I'm just going to save this in my seminar folder I have on the desktop. Right there. Okay, just pretty cool. Okay, so basically, if you've never actually used After Effects, if you've only used other programs like Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, or Word, or that sort of thing, the first thing in After Effects is that you have a project. Projects don't actually have any dimensions or anything, okay? A project is like a meta container. What it saves are links to your files that you import, and it saves the content you make in After Effects, okay? So it's actually pretty common for this to be the working behavior of video editing programs, but if you're using other stuff, it's not common. So when I save a project, there's technically nothing here yet, okay? It didn't ask me for what dimensions do I want the project. It doesn't have those. When I import files into my project, After Effects is writing a link to it, okay? So it's writing a link to those files. So that's the first thing. If you've ever used InDesign, you're probably used to the linking system. If you've used video editing programs like Premiere Pro, Avid, Final Cut, you may be used to the you may be used to the to the um, <laughs> linking system or if you've done web work same idea okay. okay so I need to import my files so I'm just going to file import or keyboard shortcut is command I on Mac control I on Windows file import file okay. okay and then it's going to give me my little folder here and i'm going to go to my where am i intro to animation folder i've got my files in this assets folder here and i'm just going to grab my images and my video file right here let's highlight them all and i'll open them and that imports them Okay, that's all it is. I'll, I'll come back to that question. How to make this picture spin a lot of miles per hour. 
technically there is no miles per hour concept in video animation. So that only obviously really works in the real world. So I'll, I'll deal with that after this. Okay, so here's what I've got. This is my blowing file. I double click. This opens a window called footage. So anything you double click on in the project panel gives you a preview window called footage. It actually opened up next to this other window that was here, composition, which I need. I'm gonna drag them together by just dragging it into the middle here. So they're kind of like dock like that. But the footage panel is general preview. And to preview video, I just hit spacebar. Okay. So by the way, that graph, that video is what actually made the background. It's basically um, my studio, black wall, a light, a camera, and me blowing flower. <laughs> I'm gonna make that look like actual smoking clouds. Okay. I've got a bunch of images here, horizontal ones, ocean view, city center, a couple vertical ones, that sort of thing. Okay. And you know what I didn't actually include in that folder? I did not include the background. So I'm going to go back to import. And by the way, this time I triggered import by double clicking on empty space. That triggers the import command. And I'm going to go grab this from another folder. So back in my seminar After Effects folder, it's in my After Effects level one, animating an After Effects, and I believe it's in the images folder, photo animations. And that's the, the wood background that I had. Those a couple others here if I want to want to do them. I'm going to grab the, the wood background and I'll grab the wood background. Just double click on it. I can also import that way. And I caused a problem. That is not the icon for an image. That's the icon for an image sequence. Like a, um, wow, what is it? Like a um, stop motion effect or like a, a time lapse. I'm going to delete that. The program has a problem when you import files with numbers in them. It basically assumes that these numbers are actually part of like a time lapse. So when I grab that one, it wants to bring this in as if this was all video. So it's actually that option down there that I didn't check before. I want to make sure it's turned off. I want to turn off the sequence. So if you have a habit of naming your files with numbers at the end, be careful that the sequence importer is disabled when you try to bring in that one file. Now it'll come in fine, and again, I now have my regular image icons. The different icons tell you what it is. That little cone there is telling me it's a video file. In the project panel, I'm just going to widen this column a little bit so I can read the names a little easier. This is all the information we have here. Okay, Clicking on one of these video or images will bit let it preview right up here in the project panel. So I can see its dimensions, its size, that sort of thing. Okay, the images are enormous, a lot bigger than I never need for video. So here's what I'm gonna do. The project does not have dimensions. The project does not have video settings. No frame rate, no dimensions, no pixel asset ratio, nothing. So what does? The composition. So in After Effects, you import your files you wanna work with. Video, images, audio, whatever you have, okay? If I have Cinema 4D files, I can import those, .c4d, okay? And I can have 3D graphics here. But they all have to be assembled into what's called a composition. For those of you who do video editing, a composition in After Effects is the equivalent of a sequence, okay? For people who use other programs, it's literally the equivalent of a document in the other programs. So it has settings and dimensions. And here's how I make one. To make one from scratch, this is what I want to do for this. I can click either the new composition button in the comp window right in the middle, or I can go to composition, new composition, or the keyboard shortcut that I like, command in or on Windows control in. Okay. They all do the same thing. They all open this window. This is the composition settings dialog. I'm going to give my comp a name because the default name is not what I like. Okay. I'm just going to call it photo animations. I'm going to call it hyphen travel because I'm going to say this is a travel. Okay. Now that name is easy. The rest of it i got to be more careful about. Video, After Effects was made originally to create video for broadcast on television. So all of the default sizes it has are basically, are basically 
for broadcast television. Sorry. So if I look at these presets, standard definition television, yes, it's still a thing, by the way. High definition television, over here in the middle area. Ultra high def television, your 4K and your 8K. And the last ones are film. These have been here for a long time, okay? Notice there's no settings for anything else. So there's no settings like if you want to do a square Instagram video. There's no settings if, settings if you want to do a vertical video, okay? For the record, most desktop Adobe software really doesn't have settings for social media. I have no defense why, they just don't, okay? So if I want any other size, I got to make it myself, okay? Now for this, this was made to basically be for horizontal video. Okay, but I can change it. So the default size, the first time you open the program, is this one. HD TV 1080. High definition television. 1080 is actually the height. That 29.97 is the frame rate. All video is is a series of still images played very, very, very fast. The frame rate is that speed. It's measured in frames per second. And there's basically three standards. Film is 24. American television is 30. Round the number up. And European television is 25. The higher the frame rate in general, the, the smoother the movement looks. You can go a lot higher than 30, like you can go 60. My, my cell phone can do 120 at this point. Usually that's when you're doing like action footage, high speed footage. And usually that's because you're going to want to slow it down. Okay, but you can do actually really high frame rates. Pretty much anything below like 15 or so frames a second, it's, it doesn't really register as continuous motion. It's more like jerky motion like you see from either stop motion animation or like you see from old silent films. Okay. But that one is the American television standard. It's the 1920 width by 1080 height. That's the largest high def we broadcast. Anything bigger than this we call ultra high def. It's kind of cool. Okay. So that's the size this was all originally built for. But if I needed to, I can just change it. I turn off this little lock aspect ratio checkbox. And I can type whatever I want in here. No problem at all. So if I wanted square for Instagram, Instagram, by the way, is 1080 by 1080. Turn off the switch, type whatever I want, no problem at all. So if you are doing something that's not one of the standard sizes we have a preset for, you can just start with one of the presets, make your changes, and that little button is to save it as a new preset. Okay. So you can basically modify the settings of this comp to whatever you like. And you can literally change it over and over again. So I could come here, make this size, make it a little bigger later, make it smaller later, no problem at all. This area is fully editable. Okay. But again, I'm going to make it a standard video size, so I'm going to do the HDTV 1080. Here's the thing to notice. HDV 1080 2997. HDV 1080 2997. Those are not the same sizes. So if you're actually working in Premiere Pro, normally in After Effects, when you build content, you're going to want to basically bring it in at the same size. In Premiere Pro, there is a command under File to basically make a new After Effects sequence, and it will match the actual sizes of your Premiere Pro sequence. It's under File, Adobe Dynamic Link. It'll literally make a After Effects comp to match exactly the same sizes. So the programs actually are designed to work very well together. So, but keep in mind, this is the problem. That looks very similar to the other name, but it's not. It's actually a different dimension, 1440 by 1080. So, this program follows the same rules of Photoshop. I need to know what size I plan to use it at. So, be careful. Ooh, that one's good. Okay, that preset is everything else. It sets the pixel aspect ratio. By the way, the par, is basically the shape of the pixels. They're not always square. Okay. Frame rate, again, that's that 2997 thing, American television standard. Okay. 
This drop-down menu basically sets whether it's a drop frame or non-drop frame. It's designed to make it more accurate with a clock. So again, use the preset if you're doing it. It's usually the best bet. Resolution is quality. Start time code is, what do I want the first number on my timeline to be? I want it to be zero. And then duration. Unlike video editing programs, Premiere Pro will give you an infinite timeline. Avid will give you an infinite timeline. Um, this program has a set duration. Comps here have a set length. So whatever I say here, 10 seconds is actually the default. That's what it's going to be. I can change it later, but it's less trouble to do it now. So I'm gonna make this, I don't need that long. I'm gonna make it one minute. One minute, zero seconds, zero frames. That's 10,000 by the way. And when I click tab or click in another field, it'll just convert it to its time for me. 5928. Okay. So comps have a set duration. Keep that in mind. Okay. Like I said, you can adjust it later. You can adjust everything here later. But some of it you don't want to. It's annoying. If you get your sizing wrong, like if someone tells me, hey, we need 1920, 1080. I make everything 1920, 1080. I animate everything at 1920, 1080. And then they tell me, hey, we were wrong. We need 4K. 4K is actually twice that size. I can make the comp larger, but that doesn't actually enlarge my content. It doesn't all of a sudden change the distance I was animating things in. So for After Effects, you really need to know your output size before you start. Trust me, it's much more annoying to fix that later. So you need to get those specs first. Okay. Background color. Okay, black is fine. I'm gonna put something here anyway to get rid of it so it's irrelevant. The background color actually doesn't, is only just a preview in this program. You're really seeing empty space. If you pick a different background color and then try to export it, it, it won't show. It, it, it basically only exports ever with a black background or you cover it with something. So again, I'll leave it black, but it's mostly irrelevant. I'll say okay. That's my composition. And again, if I need to, I can go back to composition, composition settings, and I can change it whenever I like. Yeah. So if you're not sure of the settings, of the dimensions that you need, start bigger. It's basically the Photoshop rule. If you're not sure of what size you're gonna output something as, you can always scale it down, okay? The only, the only problem really is if you're not sure of the shape so if I make something landscape like this, and then they tell me, hey, no, 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 we need it square. Well, if I've animated something going from far left to far right, when I make it square, I'm gonna lose a lot of that. So that's the only issue. Knowing the aspect ratio, the shape of the, of the video frame is really important. But if I wanted to make something for Instagram, which is 1080 by 1080 square, I could easily make it, and I often do, 1600 by 1600. And I can always, when I export it, scale it down. So it's the same Photoshop rule for those who use Photoshop. If you're not sure, make it bigger. Okay, it's kind of cool. A lot of people are making stuff at 4K now, even though they're not using 4K video in their, in their exports. Because they figure at some point they're going to start going to 4K. So they're making it larger right now to future-proof it. Okay, so I definitely could do that too, by the way, here. But um, my, my computer can't really handle 4K very well, so that's, that's kind of one of the reasons I'm not doing that. Okay, so this is my timeline. This is where I assemble things. This program, for those of you who use Photoshop and Illustrator and layer-based programs, uses layers. Everything you add to your timeline is its own layer. Now, we don't have a dedicated layers panel. It's all here in the timeline. Okay, so I want to add in that wood background. I'm just going to grab it drag it into my timeline. It becomes layer number one. Okay. Now, the wood is like 6,000 pixels wide by 4,000 tall. So it's pretty enormous. Okay. Now, it's actually too big. <laughs> I want to scale it down. So I need to access the properties of this layer. Every visual layer. 
has five built-in part properties. They are the parts of the layer. I'm going to type this in the chat window, by the way. P-A-R-T-S. Parts. So every layer has five parts. Position, anchor point, rotation, opacity, and scale. That's why I typed parts, by the way. Oh, wait. I typed that to one person. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. That was, a, that was a direct message. Okay. There. Parts. Now everyone sees it. Parts. Okay. Those are the five built-in transform properties of every visual layer. Okay. So first, I don't like this layer name. It used the name of the file. I'm just basically going to highlight that. And I want to rename it. And here's the problem. You don't rename it by double-clicking. Double-clicking on the name of a layer just opens another panel up here called layer. It's an isolation of that layer itself. Okay. So double-clicking on a layer's name does not let you resize it. So that's the first thing, by the way. Be aware of that. The second thing, here's how I rename it. Got two choices. First choice, click on the name, tap the return key on the keyboard. For Windows users, it's the enter key that's part of the main keyboard. That makes it editable. Second choice, right click on the name. Rename will be on the menu that appears. But yeah, don't double click on it, it doesn't help you. And it actually just confuses you because it covers this area. So. I'm going to rename this Wood BG. Wood BG for background. I call it Bob for all it cares, by the way. Okay. But again, don't double click on layers. That's what it does. It opens a new window. And very often, this layer panel is actually grouped with the others. So it literally opens a window here that hides the comp panel. And people look at this and it's like, hey, what am I looking at? Okay. If you see a color bar below your frame, you're in a you're in basically one of the footage or layer panels. I'm just going to close those. Okay, so the composition panel is actually the only place where you can actually see what you're working on. The other two panels are isolations; they're preview areas. Okay, now back to that. I want to scale it down. Okay, look, I can I can scale down the layer visually. There's Somewhere there's a bounding box around that layer when it's highlighted, but I can't see it at all. So I'm going to zoom out. I zoomed out a lot. That's the actual bounding box around the layer. When the layer is highlighted, you can actually see a bounding box around it like in other programs. And I can scale that. I'm not going to, by the way, but I could. Now here's how I zoomed out. It's the funniest keyboard shortcut on the planet. Comma. Comma is the keyboard shortcut in After Effects for zooming out in the comp window. Period zooms in. Comma out, period in. Hey, there's a button next to period. I wonder what that does. Slash. Slash is 100% zoom. Okay. One more. So we got comma, period, Slash, one more. Option slash, alt slash if you're using Windows. That actually runs the command fit. If you use Photoshop, maybe you're used to command zero or control zero to fit your document in the window. Don't ever press that here. It actually hides the project panel, okay? The fit in window command in After Effects is actually option slash. So, Comma, period, slash, and option slash. <laughs> yeah, for the record, a lot of people hit command zero because that actually is what it is in most other Adobe programs to fit in window. It, it literally just hides and shows the project panel. Okay, so this program is unique when it comes to keyboard shortcuts. Okay, by the way, if you want to know the keyboard shortcuts, I'm on Mac. So I go to After Effects. No, I'm sorry, I don't. It's Edit. It's Edit. On both Windows and Mac, it's Edit. Keyboard Shortcuts. Okay. This is... So, unlike other Adobe programs, we, we actually have a complete visual preview of keyboard shortcuts. I love this one, by the way, okay? If you're not in the search field and you start holding down the modifier keys in your keyboard, it shows you what the modifier keys do. 
Okay. If you know the name of a keyboard shortcut, you can search for it here in the search field, which is nice. Premiere Pro and After Effects have this visual keyboard shortcut viewer, by the way. They're the only two programs I know that are, it's built in. So that's command in the keyboard shortcuts. That's command option in the keyboard shortcuts or control, whatever it is. That's holding down alt or option, which is pretty cool, by the way. So it shows you that. So I'm going to cancel that because I don't need to do it. You can also edit the keyboard shortcuts from this area by just finding them and just typing in keyboard shortcuts here. I'm not doing that, but that's what it is. I'm going to cancel this. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Lorian. I do not actually understand that question. Sliding what? Like, I mean, technically I can zoom in and out of the window by sliding my, um, my middle mouse button, my scroll bar. That, that lets me zoom in and out of the comp, of the comp window. And if you have a trackpad, two fingers on the trackpad can zoom in and out on it. And, but if you clarify the question, I, I, I'll answer it. Okay, so again, back to my options slash. So while I could zoom out to be able to see the bounding box, I'm not going to do that. Um, for the record, in After Effects, most people who use the program a lot don't actually grab things and manually move them. <laughs> like at all, by the way. Okay, here's how I scale something. I highlight the layer. Remember my parts thing I typed into the window? P for position, A for anchor point, R for rotation, T for opacity, and S for scale. S for scale. It shows scale. Okay. If I want to see all the properties, there's a little triangle to the left of the layer name. That shows me all the transform properties. Transform, open them up, okay? As you add things to a layer, more properties pop up here. So if you add an effect, effects will pop up. You add a layer style, you get that category as well. So it keeps adding things as you do it. Okay, so this is the way it works. Now here's the problem. Um, what if I don't wanna see all five at once? Well, that's where parts comes in. Highlight a layer, P shows position, a shows anchor point, R shows rotation, T is opacity, and S is scale. By the way, I assume T is opacity because opacity transparency, but honestly, your guess is as good as mine for why it's T. Okay, so S for scale. So here's how I change the scale. I tend, I don't grab the edges of the boxes. Okay, I have to zoom out to even see it. But I do do this. Those numbers, when you hover over them, your cursor becomes a little finger icon. And if you click and drag left or right in one motion, it scrubs the value. And you can see it change in real time. Like that. Like that. Okay. So, I mean, you can also click on it and type a number, but usually the scrubbing lets you see it in real time. All of the numerical values in this program scrub in that fashion. So you just basically click and drag, we're good. If you want it to change faster, hold down shift. Okay, if you want it to change slower, the number to change slower, hold down on Mac Command and on Windows Control. The number changes slower as I scroll, so I can get more precise increments. No problem at all. I can always pick up a layer and drag it around. That's actually probably easy to do, by the way. <laughs> but P for position. If you want to move a layer horizontally or vertically only, Hovering over the value and dragging it is probably the safest way to do it. Okay. So most people use the program a lot. Like if you watch tutorials, you'll literally see them just opening up the properties and adjusting them here. Most power users of this program don't grab stuff manually. Mostly because it's actually kind of hard the more stuff you add. Yeah, like that. Okay. Now, by the way, one other thing. This is only going to work if you have a middle mouse button, like a little scroll wheel. And I do. Um, if you want to pan around the screen, you can press the middle mouse button that gives you the hand tool. For Photoshop users, if you press and hold the space bar, it gives you the hand tool if you need to pan around. So if you zoomed in and want to see something, you can navigate like with that hand. Okay, which is pretty cool. So, like I said, some of the things in the program are the same. The keyboard shortcuts, however, are mostly different. Some of them, like the hand spacebar held held down, is good. Okay. By the way, tapping spacebar actually previews your timeline. 
So keep that in mind. Every Adobe program is actually unique in that, yes, they're never the same company, but they have individual keyboard shortcuts. They have different names for the same thing. So keep that in mind. It's a whole new set of keyboard shortcuts and behaviors to learn. Okay. Even comparing this program to Photoshop is mostly for convenience. It's a topical comparison. There's a bunch of things that are just freaking completely different. Okay. Now I need to actually get my stuff in here. So I got that scaled down. I'm going to drag an ocean view above wood background so it's in front of it. S to show scale. I'm going to scale it down again to something visually that I like. Okay, that's not bad. I think I'm going to go to maybe 45%, so I'll do that. And then again, it's highlighted. I can drag it around. Okay, my original example had a frame around it. I'm going to put a frame around it. Okay, here's how I'm going to put a frame around it. I'm going to duplicate the view layer. So I'm going to change its name first to picture one. Okay, I'm going to duplicate it. Which, by the way, keyboard shortcut, Command D or Control D. You can also go to Edit, Duplicate. For some reason, that's not a right-click command. So I'll duplicate that. I get Picture 2. I'm going to highlight it again, tap Return to rename it. I'm going to call it Picture 1 Frame. Okay. I'll drag it below Picture 1. S for Scale. I'm going to scale it up a couple percent, like maybe 48%. Okay, now it's that. Now maybe that's kind of cool if you want a weird like effect, but I want a frame. So I want to change the color of this layer. So I'm going to go to my effects and presets because that's what this does. Every effect in this program, which is basically the equivalent of filters in other programs or effects in like Illustrator, that sort of thing, is here. There's one called fill, F-I-L-L, F-I-L-L, okay. It's under generate and it's called fill. I've got my frame layer highlighted, which again was a duplicate of the video layer to scale it up a little more. I'll double click on fill to apply it to that highlighted layer. And I get a red outline. Red is just the default color. I don't want red. But this is where I edit it. So I add effects from effects and presets. I can search for them or their category lists. I edit effects in effect controls or in the timeline. So now the effect is actually listed under the layer in the timeline. So if I look at the options, there's now transform, which is there before, and effects. So either of these places I can edit that effect. I'm just gonna click on the color box for fill and I'm just gonna pick a new color with my color picker. This is the one thing that's actually the same in all Adobe programs, the color picker. It's, it's pretty consistent. Okay, like that, that's nice. Now, why did I do that? Because one, I don't have to draw a rectangle and it's basically the same size. So I could have actually drawn a rectangle with a rectangle tool, but then I have to line it up and everything. So this is just basically a really quick way of getting, getting that background in, getting that frame in. Okay, here's what I need. Um, when picture moves, frame is not moving. I don't want to have to highlight them together. So here's what I'm going to do. To the right of the layer names, there's a column called parent and link. I'm going to make picture one the parent of the frame. Drop down menu for frame. Picture one is your parent. What does that mean? It means when picture one moves, its child moves. It means when this is the rotate tool on top. When picture one rotates, the child rotates. When picture one scales, S for scale, the child scales. Proportionally, by the way. So it always stays a little bigger because it started a little bigger. Okay. That's parenting. So it basically gives me a way of making one layer related to this transform properties of another. So that way, all I gotta do is worry about moving this around and we're good, okay? If I wanna make sure I don't accidentally screw up frame, I can lock it, that's lock. So now I can't directly click on the frame or interact with it. I can only just click on the picture layer and the frame's moving with it, which is what I want out of a parent. Effectively, it's not a link because it's a one-way direction. The parent is in charge. So I'm going to rotate that a little bit, maybe like that. Okay. And if I need to, I can turn it off so I can do something to the frame. Here's what I want to do to the frame. Layer, 
I'm going to steal this from Photoshop. Layer Styles. Drop Shadow. That's a Drop Shadow. Drop Shadows list. Not in here in Effects. They're not Effects. They're Styles. They're on the layer itself right down here. I'm going to go to the Drop Shadows properties. I'm just going to tweak them until I get what I want. And if you've ever used the Drop Shadow effect in Photoshop or Illustrator, it's the same thing. Distance, spread, size, that sort of stuff. Have some fun with that. Direction, that's the angle. And now I can get that looking like it's actually sitting on top of this. Okay. Not bad. Not bad at all. I'm going to grab one of the other images. By the way, um, my project panel is hidden. Do you notice? It's hidden. Um, that little chevron up there, if you can't see a panel, go to the chevrons, the double arrows. They'll show it to you. Okay, I'm going to grab in uh, City Center. I'm going to drag that in. S to scale it down. I'm just going to go to about 45. That's about all the settings. This is a vertical picture. did not want to rotate that, by the way. I wanted to just move that over a little bit. Maybe over here. That should be nice, I think. Okay. And then again, I'm going to call it Picture 2. I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Duplicate it. Rename that new picture to picture two frame. I'm going to drag it below picture two. And then S for scale, I'll bring it up about, again, 3%. Okay, again, I'm going to add a fill to it. I want it to be the same color. I don't want to add fill to it from here because it'll start red again. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to go to picture one frame, which I had unlocked, by the way. I'll go to its effect controls. I'm going to highlight fill. I believe it's in Mexico City, if anyone's interested. Don't hold me to that. I got these images from pexels.com. I believe it's Mexico City, but don't hold me to the location. I'm going to copy the fill. I just thought it was a cool picture. <laughs> um, so I went to highlight the frame layer. Highlighted the effect I added on it. Command C or Control C to copy. I'm going to relock that frame layer so I don't move it around. I'm going to go to frame 2. I'm going to paste. Pasted the effect. So effects should be copied and pasted, by the way. Okay. And then again, I'm going to make frame 2 the parent, the child of picture. So now again, when I rotate this, I can get that going on. Okay. I'll add the drop shadow to it. I'll right click on the layer. Layer styles. I can add the drop shadow. Or I can basically go turn off that property. Drop shadow. I think I can copy the drop shadow, by the way. I'm going to highlight the drop shadow. I shall hide the layer styles. Copy it from the layer. I think I can just paste it to there. Paste. So I can copy and paste effects from effects controls and styles right from my timeline. Like so. So that way I don't have to just apply them and just let, remember the values. I can basically just apply them and we're good and everyone's happy. Okay. Which is pretty cool. Like that. Now by the way, here's one more advantage of making that frame from a copy of the picture layer. I'm going to highlight picture 2. And picture 2's frame. I don't want to use the city center cathedral anymore. I want to use the town street picture right there. I highlighted the picture and its frame because, again, the frame is made from a copy of the picture layer. They're both highlighted in my timeline. Shift or Command lets me do that. Control on Windows. I'm going to hold down the Option key or Alt key on Windows. I'm going to grab Town Street and drag it from Project and drop it on those highlighted layers. It replaces them both. Ooh, I'll do that again. You can actually replace the content of a layer. Highlight the layer. Option drag something from the project panel onto it, and it replaces. By making that frame from a copy of the original picture, when I swap out both layers, I just get to replace it. This little trick, by the way, only works if the images you're replacing it with are also portrait or landscape. <laughs> if I try to replace a portrait image with a landscape image, it fails miserably because it can't properly calculate the, the center point of the layers. But it actually works out pretty well in this case. So I could easily swap this out with Town Street, which is what I'm going to do now. Highlight the layers, Option or Alt drag something onto them, just replaces them all out. So that replaces the new content. Okay. 
I want my background. Woohoo, background. I'm going to drag it above my wood background. Okay. Now, by the way, that's a problem. I'm going to solo the video layer and the wood background. This switch underneath that dot allows me to turn off every other layer. Okay. Notice, this is a lot smaller. I'm going to right click on that layer. I'm going to go to transform and I'm going to fit it to the comp. So it scales up to fit the comp size. Okay. It's also shorter. I'll fix that in a bit. I'm going to change the speed. This is what's happening. Okay, my goal, get rid of the black areas, keep the white areas, make it look more like smoke or wind or not wind or basically clouds. That's my goal. That's my goal. That's my goal. A little texture in there. Okay. Here's my goal. Here's how I achieve it. Step one, blending modes. Blending modes allow you to mix the color of one layer with the layers below it. Normally, layers work like walls. Blending modes make them not work like walls anymore. Okay. To get to that area, if you used to Photoshop and Illustrator, there are blending modes. But to get to that area, I need to change these buttons on the right side. To the right side of my layers by default are a series of switches. Doesn't really matter what they do, they're just a series of switches. Okay. At the bottom of the series of switches is a button, Toggle Switches Modes. When I click it, the entire column changes. These are the blending modes. Normal is a wall. Any other choice is not a wall. Here's the one I want. Screen. It turns off the darker pixels on the layer, leaving only the light ones. So the result is mostly no black, and then the white is doing that. But it's not enough contrast. So I'm going to add an effect to this. I want to basically make the black areas darker so more of them go away so it's a more clear removal. I'm going to make the white areas lighter so they're brighter. Go to my effects and presets. For those of you who are used to Photoshop, perhaps you're used to curves. I'm going to hide the ones in this folder called animation presets. That's what I want, curves. Again, that video layer is highlighted. I'm going to double click on curves to apply it. You can also apply it by dragging it into the timeline like that, but that's more annoying. So I just double-click usually. And again, the reason I'm only seeing the bottom two layers is because I turned on their solo switches. That turns off any layer that doesn't have the solo switch enabled. So it solos the highlighted layers. That's actually pretty cool, by the way. I love that feature. This is Curves. Curves is used to change contrast. I'm going to basically make this line steeper. Thank you, Connie. I actually had no idea where it was, by the way. <laughs> I'm not joking. I literally got it's a cool picture. So apparently that is not a cathedral. It's the Palace of Fine Arts in Mexico City. <laughs> Thank you. I really did not know where it was. it was. I admit it was a cool picture to me. So, as I basically make this line steeper, what it's doing is making the contrast of this layer greater. Like, if I just... That's the result if I just solo the video layer. So, the darker areas are getting darker as I pull the bottom slider over. And the lighter areas are getting lighter as I pull the top slider over. So, as that line gets steeper, it gives you more contrast. That's effectively what Curves does. Okay, it does more things, but it does that. So what I end up with is this really high contrast effect, and that black goes away. So when I turn back on the wood background solo again, this is what we're ending up with, that. Okay. One, I don't like the color. Two, it still looks like little particles of me blowing something. So I'm going to add some more effects. To get rid of the color... I am going to add an effect called Tritone, T-R-I-T-O-N-E. Tritone is a color reduction effect. When you apply it, it reduces whatever colors are in your layer to three. Highlights, midtones, shadows, and that's it. So if you had a full video, it would basically make it this, which is nice. I'm going to click on midtones and change that brown because I don't want a sepia effect. I want it to be blue. 
So I'm just going to go for like a blue smoke. Like that. Okay. And again, that might be kind of cool for energy, but I'm looking for, for more of a cloudy effect. So I'm going to go add another filter, another effect. For those of you who use Photoshop, perhaps you're familiar with Gaussian Blur. Or however it's pronounced. I have no idea. Gaussian Blur. Again, I'm going to double click that. It'll apply to my highlighted layer. Not legacy. Legacy is old. It doesn't have its cool features. New one. New new hotness. I'm going to raise the Gaussian Blur until this looks more like smoke. By the way, whenever you blur something, I'm going to solo that for a second, you tend to lose the edges because the edges blur in. This Gaussian Blur has a repeat edge pixels checkbox, and when you turn it on, it prevents you from losing your layer at the edges. So it just extends them out. So it's why it's cool. It's a nice, by the way. Turn on my background. Okay, so that actually does look a lot more like smoke. This preview is actually not real time. Until that green bar builds, this is not a real time preview. Everything in this program is preview is built in RAM. So every preview is a RAM preview, okay? The first time it plays through, it's usually not real time. And the more effects I add, the less real time it becomes, the longer it takes to build them, okay? So once that green bar is covering an area, that would be playing in real time. But I only have video to here. It's literally going to try to build the entire timeline as a preview. This gray bar below the numbers in my timeline has a little blue handle. That's the work area bar. It controls the part of my timeline that previews and the part that exports. Now this part is playing back in real time while that's building. That's too fast for me. Okay, I'm gonna change it. I would like to change the speed of this layer. Okay, I right click on the layer. I went to time and I'm gonna choose time stretch. That opens a dialog box. This is the stretch factor 100%. Okay, that's normal speed. I raise this number, the video plays slower. It stretches in time. I want this video to play about one quarter the speed. So I'm gonna say stretch factor 400. Okay. And then I'm gonna make sure it stays locked in the beginning, the layers beginning or end point. So stretch factor 400, that changes the duration automatically. And I say, okay. And now my layer is four times as long. And it now plays the video one quarter of the speed. Again, I got to let it build the full time. If I want to speed up this preview, I can lower the quality. This is the quality slider right there where it says full. I'm going to make it say quarter. Okay. It gives me a lower res preview, but look how much faster that builds. So if RAM is a problem, or if speed is a problem, or too many effects, I can basically knock down my preview quality so I can get a much, much faster preview. If you want the preview based on your magnification, you can set it to auto, which is actually the default. But a lot of people just work on half quality because it previews a lot faster and still looks pretty decent. Like that. But yeah, it's all a RAM thing. And again, if I want to preview more time, I just drag that blue handle out now it'll preview out to here but remember the first playthrough of that tapping spacebar to preview it is never going to be real time unless your computer is amazingly fast or you're not doing much to it basically okay that's that's what it does that's what it does i'm going to unsolo these two layers get everything back and now that's what i have i have the cusp behind it with that video blowing through it Okay, like that. So, I only have eight minutes left. This took longer to preview than I, it took longer to build than I thought it would actually. <laughs> okay, that was that was my, my big goal. Okay, we're gonna be doing other things. We're doing other things. Okay, I do want to actually show one other use of the program, which is basically motion tracking, which is completely different. So, motion graphics and animation can use Photoshop, Illustrator files, photographs video and basically i'm complete creating a a story here in this case it was basically an up next promo okay now 
But the other use of the program, aside from animation and graphics... Okay. Cool. Yeah, I want, I want, I want, to, sh I want to show the other major use for it, because these are the two things we do in our classes. We basically do motion graphics, and we do video compositing. So I want to show a quick example of video compositing. Okay. Because I have it. I'm going to save this project. File. I'm going to make a new project. New, new project. It closes the one I was in, because like I said, you can only have one. <laughs> I love that feature. It's very unique. So I want to bring in some files. I'm going to grab one of the other folders from my folder. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Seminar After Effects. Where is it? Motion Tracking Doctor Strange. I can actually import multiple folders and all the contents inside of them. I'm going to try that. Yeah, so I got the media folder, which had three videos in it, and I got my mandalas folder, which has an Illustrator file in it. It literally brought an Illustrator file. My problem is I need it differently. Bringing it in like that would bring it in flat. I actually want the Illustrator file with layers so I can animate them if necessary. So I'm going to delete that folder, go back to import. Okay. Look for my folder. Mm, yeah, mandalas. I'm going to highlight that. That's the Illustrator file. When I bring it in as part of a folder, it just brings it in flat and I have no control. But when I select the file by itself in my import window, I have a choice down here, import as. Footage brings it in flat, as if I had, like, a JPEG. Composition retain layer sizes would actually bring in a layered Photoshop or Illustrator file with layers, which means I'll be able to animate the layers separately. So when working with Photoshop and Illustrator files, those are layered programs. I can literally build a layered project in Photoshop and Illustrator, import it with that option, and the layers will be animatable in After Effects. And that's a Photoshop or Illustrator file to work with. So I'll do that. Okay. It actually turned the Illustrator and Photoshop file into its own composition, like the one I made before. And if I double click on it, that's every layer that was in the Illustrator file. In their order, in their position, the way they look. No problem at all. Okay. I can turn some layers off. I'll turn off all the even numbered ones, for example. No problem at all. I have that. So by importing that composition as a layered file, I get more options. Okay. So that's an option again for Illustrator and Photoshop files. Okay. Now, I want to actually look at this hand wave. Is this the one I want? Hand wave. I'll double click on that. It opens a footage panel. That's her. Okay. By the way, this is one of my college students. Uh, I used to teach college, actually. And she came in for Halloween just like Doctor Strange, so I took some video of her and said I was going to use it in a tutorial. Okay, this had been cut up, so I end up with like this weird jump at the end, which I don't want. So I'm just going to, in the footage panel... I can actually use the footage panel to trim off the end of this clip so it won't appear in After Effects. I move my current time indicator to where I want to trim it. In this case, for me, that's two seconds. And I click that button, Set Out, Set Out Point. If you're used to video editing programs that actually give you keyboard shortcuts for these commands, nope. This one, basically, I have to manually do by dragging the playhead and clicking the button, Set Out, or Set In if I wanted that. When I add this now to a composition, it's going to ignore the last couple frames. I don't need them. Okay. And here's what I want to do. I'm going to make this video make its own composition. So I'm going to drag that video to the new comp button at the bottom of the project panel. And that makes a new comp from it. It looks at the dimensions, the frame rate, everything about the settings of that video, and it makes the comp match it. So basically something at exactly the same size. Okay. So, this is what I have. Okay. Before, I'm going to track her hand so basically I can make something follow it. Okay. Uh, that's a good point. I like that. Okay. So, if I want to make something follow her hand, I need to basically know how the hand moves so I can have something track with it. Now, I could actually manually animate something to follow it. I don't want to do that. That's crazy talk. So the program gives me options. Here's the options, okay? They actually give you a entire program with this called Mocha AE. Effects and Presets, 
Boris FX Mocha. This is a program made by Boris FX, a company that basically is designed to track movement in video. We do this in our class. I'm going to apply Boris to her video layer. Double click, pops up. To open up Mocha, I click the Mocha button and it opens its own window. The host is not set to, okay, yeah, cancel that, sorry. Um, it likes when I have this set to full resolution. It likes when I have that set, that preview set to full. Okay. Now it will open up. Start. Oh, rats. There it is. It, it, it got, it took a little second to get used to the size of the window I was in. Okay. Mocha starts off in a workspace called Essentials. I like Classic because it gives me more options. Mocha is a completely different program. Mocha has completely different names for everything. <laughs> but basically, here's what I do. I want to track the movement of her hand, so I'm just going to slide around Mocha's timeline until I can see her hand. I think that's a good place right there. That's where I'm like 22 or something like that. Here's how I track. I use the tools in Mocha to draw a mask around the hand, and then I say, hey, track that. Follow that. And it's really good at it. These are the tools. That little pin, like in other Adobe programs, lets me draw a mask. So I'm going to grab it. This is, by the way, not like the pin in other programs. It's actually an X pin, which has a different rule. I'm going to click, 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 click inside the hand. I'm not trying to trace the hand. I'm just trying to say, hey, follow this. So I need to find an area that has good visibility and pretty decent contrast. That's what it does. The program, when I right click, stops making the shape. And then it switches to its own arrow tool called the pick tool. I, I can resize it if I want. If I want to make it more rounded, I can make these handles shorter. That makes it rounded. But again, I don't care because I'm not trying to outline it. I'm just trying to say, hey, look at this area. Okay, it did that. I want it to track this area. That's what the buttons over here with T's are for. I'm in the middle of my video. So I'm going to track forwards from the middle. So it runs to the end. That button, track forward, does that. I click it, I wait for a couple seconds, and then it starts to follow the hand as the video plays. It's tracking with it. As that hand closes, it's still tracking with it. Okay. Not bad. The blue area indicates it actually now knows how that moved. I'm gonna grab my playhead back. Mocha is actually installed automatically with After Effects. As in, you can't stop it. If you have After Effects installed, you already have Mocha. It didn't even give you a choice. It's literally on your computer. <laughs> it, it's kind of insidious. By the way, um, when you install After Effects, it auto-installs Mocha with this program, and it auto-installs Cinema 4D Lite. As in, you can't stop it. You're not given a choice. It auto-installs when After Effects installs. Why would I use Mocha instead of the motion tracking that's built into After Effects? I don't know if I should say that on a live stream. <laughs> Honestly. Honestly. I, I, I have nothing good to say about the built-in motion tracking in After Effects. Even Adobe admits it's pretty weak. Because they give you this with it. <laughs> um, the motion tracking built-in is called point tracking. This is actually used a technology called planar tracking, which pretty much everyone agrees is superior in every way to give you more accurate tracking. So, I will pretty much always use Mocha for any tracking, even anything simple. I admit that. I go back to where I started from, and I'm going to track forward this time. Eventually, it's going to fail because your hand leaves the screen. That's what that indicates. It terminated prematurely. It couldn't find any more information. Okay, okay, it's fine. I mean, the hand leaves the screen. What do I expect? <laughs> it, it got to about frame nine. It's pretty good. I can't argue. That was actually pretty decent. But, yeah, when something leaves the screen, it's obviously going to fail like this. Okay, I'm going to rename this layer, which, by the way, I can do by double-clicking. <laughs> Hand. Okay. I'm going to save everything I've done in Mocha. Command S to save. Then I'm going to close the Mocha window. That data is now saved in the effect. If I delete the effect, that data is lost. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this data and apply it to a new layer. The new layer I'm going to apply it to. Layer, new, null object. 
A null object is an invisible layer, but it has the transform property, so it's good for holding the data from that, that effect. That's a null. I hate that color, by the way. That's the color. I think yellow is easier to see in this case. See? Yellow! That's the color that layers highlight, by the way, that little label. <laughs> I want to send the data from the effect to this null so it'll move with the hand. I open up tracking data. This is the effect. Again, which I only see when I have that video layer that the effect is on highlighted. Create track data. I got to make sure that little gear is on next to the hand. It is. I'm good. I say okay. All the numbers now filled in. Okay. Type of data. I only care about the movement. That's transform. Corner pin would be if you're like trying to match a, a screen or something like do screen replacement. But I care about how it transformed, how it moved, how it rotated, how it scaled. That's the data. What layer do I want to apply it to? The one called null. I'm going to rename it, but whatever. Null. And then apply. That null now moves, rotates, and scales how the hand does. I now have that null moving with the hand. Okay. I'm going to call, by the way, that null highlight right click hand movement. If I tap U on my keyboard, it shows me the keyframes that are now on that layer. Position, scale, and rotation. That's actually what was applied from Mocha. I'm going to go grab that other comp I had, Mandala Wheels. I'll drag it right there. Okay. I'm going to move it so it starts on top of the hand. That looks good. I like that. Then I'm going to make Mandala Wheels the child of the null. And now the Mandala Wheels moves with it and scales with it and rotates with it because it's following the null, which is following the hand. That's motion tracking. Okay. I would normally just make the, it notices nothing before it starts the data. So about there, I would just shorten the null layer. So it starts right there. So Mandala wheels, edit split layer that cuts it. I delete the first one. I go to where I want the Mandala to vanish. Think about right there is good. Highlight the layer. Edit. Split layer. Delete the last one. And now I have a layer that only exists for that time. We don't actually have a razor blade. I have to actually split it to do that. I could actually edit the keyframes of the null object to make it start off screen if I really wanted to. Effectively, since the motion tracking started, it stopped at my frame nine, there's no more data, but I could literally manually make keyframes to make it start off screen if I tried to. Okay. I mean, technically I could also probably make it actually just follow the last movement there to go off screen as well. But uh, in this case, the animation, these things are designed to pick up like this. They start in a certain place. That's why I cut them. So they basically have them appear like that. I could have also animated, just hand scaled that in, just animated maybe the scale or the opacity for it fades in or something. So I could have actually given myself a different appearance animation for this. That definitely would have worked. Okay. Questions? Normally, I would, if I wanted to do this, I would normally delete the keyframes in front of it, highlight them and delete them, and literally just make more. <laughs> I'd basically animate them in. So the mandala is actually, so one of the properties that was taken from the tracking was the rotation. So technically that's the rotation right there. So it actually has keyframes in it. That's why it's doing it. If I wanted to get rid of the keyframes for rotation, I click off the stopwatch. Clicking on the stopwatch lets me animate something. Clicking off the stopwatch lets me delete the keyframes. So now there's no rotation keyframes and I could manually add them in. So I'm going to write, I deleted the keyframes by turning off stopwatch. That, those keyframes were taken from the tracking data. Uh, didn't mean to do that, sorry. I'm going to right click on rotation, I'll say reset so it goes back to zero. I'm going to turn on the stopwatch. This becomes the first rotation keyframe because I deleted the other ones. I'll go to the end of my layer, where it, right before it vanishes, and I'm going to change the number. I'm going to change it from 0x to 1x. That gives me a new rotation keyframe. 
the mandala now rotates one full turn. Like that. So the original keyframes here for position scale and rotation are from tracking the hand. I can always delete keyframes I don't need. Maybe I don't want it to scale, for example. I can always click off the stopwatch to delete the keyframes. And if I needed to, I can manually animate them. Okay. We didn't really get an animation per se, but that, that's what we have. Okay. So that, that's how I'd animate stuff. I will save this. Questions? Okay. Yeah, I have technically been to 7.30, but I want to show one more thing because it's just freaking amazing. How accurate is Mocha overall? It's freaking amazing. It's used... Pretty much Mocha is considered professional level motion tracking. As in either Mocha AE or Mocha Pro, which is the full version, is used in a ton of television and films. So it's amazingly accurate tracking program. Um, if you want, I have links on my on YouTube to some tutorials. If you're interested, I can put them in the chat window after I finish this. One more thing, because it's just kind of cool. Okay, I'm going to solo just the video layer for a second. That is tape on the wall. I hate that. Okay, so, and this is basically the door, which I also hate. There's a feature in the program, I'm going to zoom out a little bit, and I'm going to draw right around here a f mask around the door. Okay, I'll turn off solo. Why did that not work for me? Because I have the wrong layer. That's I suck. I suck, I suck, I suck. I need to have the video layer highlighted. That's why I didn't do anything. Okay. I want to basically mask out the door handle frame over there. Okay. By default, masks show what's inside of them. M to show my masks. Subtract. That's a hole. It's actually empty space, by the way. Okay. I need the mask to move along with it. So I'm going to right click on the mask. This is the only tracking I'll do in the program. Mask tracking. I can actually track the position of that mask. I'll track forwards. The mask actually now tracks with it. I'm going to go back to here. I'll track backwards. The mask is actually going to move as the door frame moves. So it'll stay inside of it all times. It'll stay on top of it. Okay. Because here's what I want it to do. I want the program to fill in that empty mask space to cover the door. We have in this program a feature. So now it tracked with it. I can give her the tracker. It's now irrelevant. Close panel. The mask now moves with the door so it stays on top of it at all times. Okay. We have a feature in this program. Content aware fill for video. Window. Content aware fill. I'm going to make this taller so I can see all of its options because I can't see some of its options right there. Okay. Content aware fill for video. You mask out a part of a video layer. You got to make sure your mask stays in front of the thing you want it to remove. That's why I track the mask with the tracker. You basically, I'm going to give this an alpha expansion of 5. It gives me a nice soft edge a little bit. Fill method, I believe, is edge blend is the proper one for this. And then I tell it to generate a fill layer. And what the program is doing is analyzing this empty space. And it's actually building video. It's actually building, sorry, a series of still images to fill in that space and get rid of the door. The little scroll bar on the bottom, that's actually how long it's taken. It's building an image for each single frame of my video on my timeline. And when it's done, ooh, it's done. I can play and there's no door anymore. At all. That's content aware fill for video. It's designed to remove annoying things you don't like in your video. Like that door or that tape. Or the person from down the hall. They go away. Okay. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So, that'll conclude our training session. One more thing I want to show you before you leave. And I'll answer the questions because I'm, I'm not going anywhere, okay? <laughs> so, again, Noble Desktop is a software training company. And we have classes on After Effects. We have classes on video editing. And we have classes on Premiere Pro for those of you who are interested. 
We actually have an entire track for After Effects, a certificate program that's a multi-course thing. We have two classes in After Effects, Premiere Pro, and we even have a portfolio course in there. So if you check out our website, we'd really appreciate it. And thank you for attending my What is Adobe After Effects seminar.